Hi, everyone, and welcome to Reality Check with Jess. Thank you for tuning in with me. So I have some information that's very interesting about one of the plaintiffs in the student loan or student debt relief lawsuit who essentially got it dismissed, right? So there's two things, and I'm going to show you proof for both. So one is that they had almost $50,000 in PPP loans forgiven, right? And another is I'm going to show you proof after I go through this article and a few things, I'm going to show you proof that they actually are probably going to get their loans completely forgiven by the IDR waiver. Yes, you heard me when I said that, right? They sued to stop student debt relief because they said due to them having FFEL loans, they weren't included and it was unfair because they should have been able to do a notice and comment on it. And so they got it canceled for everyone. But the reality is they may get their loans fully forgiven beyond 10, 20,000 fully forgiven. Okay. By the IDR waiver. I'm going to show you proof of that in a moment. So let's go into the PPP loan forgiveness. And before anyone says that, oh, well, PPP loans were always meant to be forgiven. No, they were not. And <laughs> that is selective amnesia. Uh, if you go back uh, or just even in your own mental Rolodex, you will remember they were called PPP loans for a reason. They were not called PPP grants. When they passed Congress and when they drummed up American support, it was positioned as loans for small businesses businesses, you know, they weren't supposed to go to Kanye West and Kim Kardashian and other celebrities. They were supposed to be for small businesses to help them stay afloat and they would pay it back at a low interest rate. But because of that, the government would then still make money off of it. So the businesses would get help, the government would get money, and then everyone would be a little bit better off. And also it was supposed to only be for them to keep people employed because of the shutdowns, right? But still, people lost their jobs. Uh, don't forget, remember, after they even gave the bailout for the airlines, the airlines, they put a contingency in there that they couldn't fire anybody, I think, like before September 30th or something. And then here comes October 1st and they fired everybody. <laughs> then also, like I said, it was originally supposed to be a loan that after everyone got the money, they went back in session and without the support of the American people, they changed it around and said, actually, we're just going to forgive this for everyone. I mean, this was before most people even made a first payment. That is a fact because they literally just had to show, okay, well, this could have went to past expenses and things like that. Look, that was actually part of uh, the... Um, the parameters with it when you got it. Oh, well, this is paying for things that have occurred since the shutdown and I got it after that. So it's paying for a past expense or here's the expense that it paid for. You had time to show these documents and literally just, it was very simple, apply for forgiveness. So many businesses had forgiveness before making one single payment, not one payment for PPP loans, all right? So keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, also, so let's get into this, but before we do, don't forget to like and subscribe. That really helps YouTube show that, uh, you know, or know that people are interested in this content and it will push it up to the top of the list a little bit more. You know, I am a small channel. Um, so, you know, every like, every subscription, every comment really, really makes a difference. So thank you so much for everyone who has commented who has liked the videos, who has subscribed. I really, really appreciate your support. And if you are able to, I do have my cash app down in the corner, Tora Blessed, if you're able to send any donations. So thank you so much in advance. But let's get into this one. We'll talk about how Myra, one of the plaintiffs, had a PPP loan, right? It was that's been completely forgiven, basically. Um, I think I said for like, except for maybe five bucks out of it, almost $50,000. Um, and then we'll talk about how I realized, and I'm going to show you the proof, that she will probably have all of her loans completely forgiven through the IDR waiver while she has gotten everybody else in a pickle, right? So let's get into it. 
So it says, plaintiff, and this is from The Intercept, plaintiff in lawsuit opposing Biden's student debt forgiveness had PPP loan forgiven. This is the lawsuit aimed at ending Biden's debt forgiveness program is being bankrolled by a well-connected right wing group. Uh, and just for that, it's from it's being bankrolled by the Job Creators Network, who is also backed by the billionaire co-founder of Home Depot and the Mercer family, who have also been big donors to Trump. And also there are connections to the Federalist System society of which the judge Mark Pittman who ruled on this and ruled against the people against the the um against the Department of Education essentially and said that the debt relief was illegal he is actually i believe a vice president of one of his local chapters of the Federalist Society so go figure uh, so the plaintiff in a lawsuit seeking to overturn President Joe Biden's student debt forgiveness program has herself been a beneficiary of debt cancellation in the form of a paycheck protection program business loan worth over twice the maximum amount covered under Biden's program. Myra Brown, one of two plaintiffs in the Texas lawsuit, owns Desert Star Enterprises, Inc., Desert Star, which appears to be a sign-making business, and was granted $48,000, which was granted a $48,000 loan, of which $47,996 was forgiven on April 27th, 2022. So she had all of the $48,000 forgiven except for four bucks. Yeah. By comparison, Biden's student debt forgiveness per program provides a maximum of twenty thousand in forgiveness if the person seeking the relief received a Pell Grant, which means their family was extremely poor and their family probably made sixty-five thousand or under. That's a good majority of Pell Grant recipients. Not a single person, but the whole family, and ten thousand if it wasn't a Pell Grant. Brown argues in her case that she's being harmed by Biden's debt relief order because she is not eligible for it. Her student loans were originally funded by private companies. So in case you aren't aware, Myra has FFEL loans. Now, as everyone knows, FFEL loans were eligible if you consolidated before September 29th. So the moment that this was announced, I know everyone you know, still feels really upset. They feel like the rug got pulled from underneath them, which I agree that the surprise deadline was definitely not good. I do not agree with the surprise deadline. But I will say from the beginning, it was always a requirement to consolidate. But I, I, I get both sides in terms of if you have an FFEL loan, sometimes your you know your interest rate could be as low as two percent, and so you're like, okay, well, I don't want to lose that. If they're saying they may be able to forgive it, you know, this portion of it because it won't get rid of all my loans, but they're able to forgive this portion, and you know, I don't have to then consolidate and possibly have a higher interest rate. I get that, but the reality is, it was always the we're working on it, we're talking, we're seeking options. It was never a guarantee. The only guarantee ever was to consolidate, um, which is why I actually made a video before the deadline happened, which was a surprise to everyone saying, hey guys, I just want to read between the lines for you here. The actual language says the only way to do it is to consolidate. I know people are saying, you know, hey, if you sit and wait, something might happen, but I don't suggest that because that's not a guarantee. And unfortunately, um, it, it worked out that way. So I, you know, it's not that I wanted to be right about that, but I was just reading what was there and I wasn't taking the political spin from the talking heads. And, you know, we did get some people who consolidated before then, so it made them eligible. But now all of us are kind of in a pickle because of the um, debt relief being blocked, but which is why I've also been focusing so much on the IDR waiver, because the IDR waiver is the one thing that's really guaranteed. And this is what I've been pushing and pushing while everyone has been focused on student debt relief. I kept saying, hey guys, um, I know we're all focused on the 10, 20,000, but you really need to pay attention to this IDR waiver and the deadlines for this and how this can impact you. But back to this. So it says Brown's case is one of a flurry of right-wing lawsuits aimed at ending Biden's student debt forgiveness program. Though many have been dismissed due to a lack of standing, this one has not. A Donald Trump appointed judge, Marty Pittman of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas, has indicated he wants to fast track it. Side note, this was obviously written before the ruling yesterday. This was written on the 9th. The ruling happened yesterday on the 10th. So it says student debt relief advocates say the loss I'll say the loss of lawsuits are astroturf efforts by right wing political organizations. These sham lawsuits are blatantly manufactured by billionaire funded right wing organizations whose only purpose is to play dirty politics. Braxton Brewington, spokesperson for the Debt Collective, told the Intercept. These plaintiffs aren't actually harmed by student debt 
cancellation. They're simply willing to be political pawns for dark money groups who will do anything to prevent working people from having financial breathing room. When The Intercept contacted Brown, Myra Brown, the plaintiff, for comment, she responded via text message with a picture of a printout reading, we have no comment, and directing any inquiries to the Job Creators Network, a conservative advocacy organization bankrolling the lawsuit. The Job Creators Network was funded by, was founded by the CEO of Home Depot and funded by the conservative Mercer Family Foundation. The Paycheck Protection Program is not comparable to Biden's bailout, Elaine Parker, president of the Job Creators Network, told The Intercept. Congress passed PPP, making it a legal program. Biden Pi passed Congress, making it illegal. PPP was an emergency measure to help small businesses survive government-imposed lockdowns. PPP was always designed to be forgiven if certain parameters were met. Well, first of all, that's a lie. Um, it was not designed to be forgiven. That's why it was called a PPP loan. And I mean, anybody can go and, and, you know, look that up when they were talking about it, unless everyone's kind of got this Mandela effect going on. Um, but it was always designed to be a loan. And then later on, they changed it to forgiveness, right? That, that did not happen in the same breath. That did not happen in the same vote at all. That was not in the original program. And also, it's interesting how it says it was an emergency measure to help small businesses survive. But small business, last I checked, uh, Kanye West doesn't have a small business. Kim Kardashian doesn't have a small business, you know, and, and that's part of the problem with the way these things are defined too, because a small business can be, I believe, by SBA Small Business Association um, or Small Business Administration, excuse me. The I think the legal definition of a small business can be anything under a thousand employees. So I mean that's a lot, and you can actually have multiple subsidiaries. You can have multiple franchises. You can have multiple locations. But if you register each location as its own LLC, for example, you've now made that into a small business. So each Walmart location that you have can technically be a small business, depending on how they set it up. Yes, guys, that's how that works. So that's why. On this channel, like I said, I cut through the muck. I give the reality check because they they use these terms and they know that most people don't actually know the, the dirty details at all or what the definition really is. So a definition of a small business in this country legally is not necessarily a small business. We need to understand that, which is why major corporations or billionaires are able to get loans for small businesses. So it says, The Intercept also promptly received an email from T.J. Weiner, who identified himself as an employee of the Job Creators Network Foundation, from an email address bearing the domain CRC Advisors, a crisis communications firm. CRC's top funder is the Federalist Society, the powerful conservative legal group whose members include all six conservative Supreme Court justices, many of whom the Federalist Society advocated for and helped shepherd their appointments. Pittman, the federal judge presiding over this case, is himself a vice president and a founding member of the Tarrant County Federalist Society. Oh, goodness. I, I mean, let's see. Yeah, we'll, we'll read the rest of this real quick. So in 2019, CRC found itself in hot water over its attempts to clear then Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct allegations by Christine Blasey Ford. After working with the conservative legal activist Ed Whelan to float cl claims of a doppelganger Blasey Ford mistook for Kavanaugh, Whelan retracted the claims and apologized for what he called an appalling and inexcusable mistake of judgment. Advocates of student debt relief have criticized the hypocrisy of business owners who are comfortable with debt relief for their own companies, but not for students. Quote, like the Republican members of Congress who took out PPP loans while denouncing student borrowers seeking relief, Myra Brown believes in debt relief for me, but not for thee, Barrington told The Intercept. This hypocrisy only underscores the cynical motives of plaintiffs and the baselessness of their case, which should be dismissed. Yeah, I mean, let's not also forget that members of Congress got PPP loans, which is insane and really shouldn't have been allowed from the beginning, and they got them forgiven. That's why I hate even saying PPP loans. I prefer to use the term PPP grant because it was never a loan. Um, it was never a loan. I mean, it, it was supposed to be a loan, but then we were lied to and they changed it basically to a grant. I mean, the parameters they had to meet were so minuscule. It wasn't like us. I mean, if you want IDR forgiveness, right, you have to pay for 20, 25 years. Many of them didn't have to make one single payment. 
Then it says in August, Biden took a swipe at Georgia rep Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, I find it absolutely fascinating that some of the folks who are talking about this is big spending are the same people that got 150000 in PPP money, including the, what's her name, that woman who believes in the, anyway. The White House official Twitter account later called out Greene by name, clarifying that the figure was actually a bit higher, $183,504 in PPP loans forgiven. And also, side note, another politician got about a million, I think over a million, forgive it. Um, yeah, it's a lot of money. So it says, Brewington also called on Biden to use additional authorities to block these types of lawsuits. Instead of letting student debt relief be subverted by these bad faith actors and Trump appointed judges, President Biden used his compromise and settlement authority to cancel student debt, thereby pulling the rug out from under these bogus lawsuits and delivering on his promise, he said. And then the last paragraph, Pittman is one of 200 Trump-appointed federal judges, a group that includes nearly as many appeal court judges as Barack Obama appointed in both of his terms. So literally, Trump appointed as many judges in four years as, you know, as Obama did in, in eight, pretty much. That, that's a lot. And this affects us. You know, you may not think it affects you because these are not the things that are always shown on TV and given a lot of attention when they're appointing these judges. But you see how this has an effect in real life on all of us, not just where you live. So this is given Pittman's right wing association, student debt relief proponents are concerned that his conservative bent could lead to the case being upheld. This summer, Pittman struck down the Texas law banning people under the age of 21 from carrying handguns, citing founding era history and tradition. So... They did have a right to be concerned because he struck it down. Now, if you go to the studentaid.gov, before it was saying, okay, we're still accepting applications, we're still processing them, we just can't apply it yet. Now, it actually says student loan debt relief is blocked. It says courts have issued orders blocking our student debt relief program. As a result, this time we are not accepting applications. We are seeking to overturn those orders. If you've already applied, we'll hold your application. And then it says subscribe, check back here later for updates. We'll post more information soon as further updates are available. Then when you go to the actual uh, tab for student loan forgiveness, it has it here too. It has the big yellow uh, sign saying student debt relief is blocked. And that they're not accepting applications because this is different from having just the injunction before where it's like, okay, it's on hold. We can't do anything for it, but doesn't mean we can't process it. Well, now they can't even take more applications. They really can't do anything. So whatever they processed before is what they processed before and they kind of have to hold it. They can't do anything else with student debt relief right now until this is resolved because it has been ruled illegal by this judge, Judge Pittman. Now, let's get into the little juicy part that no one else has called out. And I mean, no one. You will not hear this anywhere else yet. Maybe some people will start digging into it and realize it, but I, this is going to be the first time you see this one. And I mentioned this at the beginning. So let's look at Miss Myra's LinkedIn. Okay. So Myra, if you look at this, she, uh, well, it shows you President High Value Signs and Studio, right? So that's, that's her small business that she got the PPP loan for. But she graduated in 1993 from the University of Texas. 1993. So that was 30 years ago, right? So if she still has student loan debt, um, it would be 30 years old. Then... Southern Methodist University, Cox School of Business. She got an MBA, graduated in 2002, which means that her student debt for that one would be, guess what, 20 years old, right? So if she has graduate student debt, 20 years old, and she has this undergrad debt, 30 years old, that means with the IDR waiver, potentially... If she was, let's say, for example, on an ICR plan, or not ICR, ICR, but I believe forgives after 25 years. There's one of them that actually does 20 years regardless of, of what. Um, but either way, this, the, this one for her undergrad would be done with the IDR waiver. Because remember, the IDR waiver is going to uh, calculate and use all of your payments. It doesn't matter if you run an IDR plan or not, right? 
So any federal loans she has for 30 years, you know, from undergrad would be gone. Then her loans from grad school could possibly be gone as well, right? Or very close to it because the IDR waiver is going to be applied in July, 2023. That would then be 21 years for her. So for her to stop the relief for everyone else. And I saw in another article that she says she owes about 17,000 and she was complaining that she has uh, FFEL loans. Well, FFEL loans, if you consolidate them to a direct loan before the IDR waiver is applied, right? So if you did that right now, come January, they're going to count all the payments you made on that FFEL loan since, since you've had it right? They're going to count all those payments and even forbearance and deferment times, except for in-school deferment. And they're going to say, okay, well, we're giving you IDR credit for those payments. So her loans could be discharged, if not right away, then very shortly, all of it, right? So if that's what's so crazy about this is the fact that she could potentially have all of her undergrad student debt, if she still has any, discharged immediately because of the IDR waiver, and then any uh, grad debt that she has, even the FFEL debt, could either be fully discharged or in a few years fully discharged. And in fact, actually with the new plan where uh, they're talking about um, discharging uh, loans that were, you know, the original balance was 12000 and under after 10 years. We don't know. If her loans could be discharged through that way too. So it's just amazing that this woman actually is going to potentially have her loans discharged, right? But she has made it hard for everyone else. Uh, it, it's just, it's crazy. It makes no sense. It's just very selfish. Um, It shows the selfishness of it all that it's like, all right, you know, why would you want to stop it for everyone else when you're going to get this yourself? Um, It's just, but this is how it is, people. This is how it is. So that's Myra Brown. She is the plaintiff, one of the plaintiffs. And then you have Alexander Taylor, um, who actually was going to get the $10,000 in relief and was just upset that he wasn't going to get 20,000 because he didn't have a Pell Grant. So I wanted to give you guys an update on this because I think this is important information for everyone to know so that we know who these players are and some of the background information, because this is political. You know, this, the fact that the judge said, well, I'm going to, you know, judge this on the merits and didn't dismiss it because of standing is a problem. It's a problem because now what it does is for an appeal, in appeal, they can potentially take this up to the Supreme Court, and the appeal will then be on the merits versus on standing, you know, whether they even have the right to, you know, pursue this or not. So the thing that we can hope for is an appeal and that that goes in our favor. And then, of course, if that goes in our favor, they are going to take it to the Supreme Court, which uh, the the last lawsuit with Frank Garrison, they tried to do it, but Amy Coney Barrett, you know, shut that down and didn't let go further. Um, hopefully the same thing happens and we get back to this because a lot of people were depending on this. But what I will say is it puts them in a position now to continue this pause. If they don't continue this pause, it will be a disaster. So now that this is shut down, um, anyone who consolidated already, if you're worried, like, oh my gosh, I consolidated because I, you know, I wanted this relief and whatnot. Well, you may still get some relief because I, I'm going to I would hope that they continue this payment pause. I don't want to say I'm going to assume, but I would hope that they continue the payment pause because that's the only thing that would make sense at this point. And they need to announce that immediately instead of announcing it later because they always wait until the last minute until it's about to expire like the day before and then they announce it, which is ludicrous. I mean, anybody else would get fired if they did that on their job, but that's a whole, whole different topic for a different day. Um, 
And then if you did also consolidate because of the IDR waiver, it helps you out a bit too, because if you're worried about what your payments might increase until the waiver kicks in, well, if they continue this pause, then that's money that you don't have to spend. So that would be great, you know, once it's a direct loan. Um, but yeah, guys, this is this is what's going on. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Hopefully we hear something soon. I think now that this has happened, we're going to hear something from that Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. And I corrected myself in a post, but I wanted to say before when I was saying we were waiting to hear from Judge Autry, we did hear from Judge Autry. Judge Autry ruled in favor of the Education Department and said that the six states did not have standing. They appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court and the Eighth Circuit has put an injunction on it and um, now we're waiting to hear back from them. And the crazy thing about that is, is if the Eighth Circuit didn't grant that injunction, right, or didn't have it for this long, then applications for debt relief would have been processed now. They would have been processed by now. So even if this decision came down, there still would have been millions of people who got the debt relief um, applied to their account. So all of this really works together and is tangled together. So right now, this was a federal uh, district court judge who ruled in favor of the plaintiff, so ruled against student debt, and now the U.S. Department of Education has already submitted an appeal for it, and that appeal is going to the Fifth Circuit Court in Texas. So we are now going to wait for the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals to give us um, a result or ruling, and that's in Missouri. That has to do with the six Republican states. And now we're going to be waiting for this case to find out what happens on appeal, which is the Fifth Circuit Court. And then there is also a court case with the Cato Institute, another right-wing think tank who is trying to stop student debt relief. Um, I'm concerned that this could be a snowball of a domino effect. So Biden needs to figure something out because this is what he had been touting really as the win. Um, so he needs to figure something out. <laughs> they better continue the pause and it would probably behoove him to use the powers that he has in the Higher Education Act of 1965 and just cancel it all or a significant sum for people and do it across the board without an application. Um, but of course, then, I mean, I don't know, are people going to sue and say, I want to opt out like the guy Frank did? This has all been so convoluted and political, but you know, my role here is just to give you what's going on, give you my assessment. So hopefully I've given you enough information so that you feel comfortable, that you understand what's happening and how it is actually affecting everyone. Um, but again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining. Please, if you have not already, hit the like button. Please subscribe. Please share this because this is really important information. A lot of people are upset and nervous. And, you know, this is this is not good. You know, we're in the middle of a recession. People are struggling to feed their family, not knowing how their bills are going to pay. Meta, you know, the owner of Facebook just laid off 11,000 people uh, <laughs> this week. People are getting laid off. Things are not good. You know, you can like any politician as much as you want, but we have to be real. Things are not good for a lot of people. Um, so this is this is a big deal. This is the last thing that people needed to, to have to worry about. Um, and then also, if you're able to, my cash app is Tora Blessed. So thank you so much for everyone, you know, who has sent donations. I really appreciate it. No donation is too small. It really helps me and my family out. So thank you so much guys and i will keep you updated as i hear more information and i will talk to you next time <laughs>